as his art to fight AIDS by provoking dialogue through public programs like this, exhibitions, publications, and artist projects. We also preserve a legacy of the cultural contributions of HIV AIDS activism and support artists living with HIV because AIDS is not over. I'm so thrilled to introduce Aging Fiercely While Trans today. Today's program is inspired by the life and legacy of Chloe Sabilo, an artist and activist who fought for decades for people living with HIV and the trans community. The Visual Aids is thrilled to have recently published our duets book on Chloe with a fantastic conversation between Alice O'Malley and Che Gossett, who's here today. Here's the publication, and we have some in the back available today. Um, Che's gonna speak a little bit more about working on the publication and Chloe's life, and I wanted to read a quick excerpt from J.P. Borum's preface of duets to set the stage for today's event. Chloe was a legend. She was fierce. Chloe devised a simple but powerful language with which to speak the unspeakable truth about a system that wants people like her dead. The system got what it wanted, or did it. Go look at Chloe's drawings and ask yourself, who has the final say here? The last snap. She's calling it out. We have to listen up and keep working to humanize inhuman, inhumane systems, destroy the gender binary, and advocate for people with AIDS and homeless trans kids. So Chloe passed away in 2011, and although she's no longer with us, it's clear to those who love her and the organizers of today's event that she would be among the growing intergenerational dialogue of trans lives. To celebrate Chloe's spirit and voice, we're bringing together a great group today to discuss aging fiercely and resiliently. I want to thank our participants, Sheila Cunningham, Kate Hornstein, Miss Major, and Jay Toole. Um, their biographies are going to be read by our moderator, Raina Gossett. I also want to thank Everyone from the New York City Trans Oral History Project, Jean Vaccaro, A.J. Lewis, <coughs> Roderick Cook, Ted Kerr, and Raina Gossett, who we've worked with really closely on today's event. I'm thrilled to have Raina moderating, and Ted Kerr who deserves a particular shout out for conceiving of the idea for today's program. We'll have presentations and a panel from 2 to 4. We'll then have a reception until 5 p.m. For, for people to hang out and meet Ms. Major and Jay and Sheila and Raina and Kate, and we'll have a performance by Ms. June. I want to thank Streetwise and Safe for hosting us today, particularly Mitchell Mora for working so closely to make today happen. I want to thank all the organizations in the building, Fierce, SRLP, ALP, um, and Juana from SRLP and Cleo from ALP have been really great to work with. Um, I also want to thank the New York Council on the Humanities who supported this program today. Um, and just to note, we have duets books in the back for $10 or pay what you wish, um, and well, as well as Chloe bookmarks and zines, which are free. Um, if you enjoy today's conversation, we're going to have a book club at Blue Stockings, a free event on Wednesday to follow up today's conversation, um, to have a more uh, a discussion about the book and some of the issues that were raised today. Um, so it's now my pleasure to pass the microphone over to Che Gossett, who's going to tell us a bit more about Chloe and the Duets book. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, I think, Alex, you gave like an amazing synopsis of Chloe's life. Um, she was a phenomenal artist and activist, um, trans feminist, um, and really through her artwork, like tried to change the terms by which we talk about trans politics um, in really liberating um, and like gender self determining ways. And so I just mainly wanted to, what well, we just mainly wanted to kind of like bring her into the room and her legacy as a long term survivor. Um, and uh, her legacy as an, uh, an artist and AIDS activist um, and someone who, uh, whose presence, uh, like, well, no longer uh, corporally here, definitely shapes our political scene. Um, so thank you, and uh, there's like so much wisdom in the room, and I just want to pass off the mic to one of my greatest inspirations, uh, my sister Raina. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here in a room with like, four people that I'm huge fans of, um, and to be able to do it with uh, this group that is new, the New York City Trans Oral um, History Archives. 
and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And then I'm really just going to hand off the um, the night, the evening, the daytime, all of these times blending into one, <laughs> to our fabulous panelists. So the New York City Trans Oral History Project um, is uh, something that we recently just started, and we're really thrilled to have our first event be with the legendary folks in, uh, on this panel. Um, and it's new, it's local. We believe that the histories that our community um, so often has erased, right? Um, historical erasure is one kind of, of the many violences of transphobia uh, that trans people have to deal with. Is um, so that history should be told by the people who lived it. And so, like trans and gender nonconforming people uh, who have been inspiring all of us. So that's something that we're really excited to have for this event today. Um, we also want to name that we been having a wonderful partnership, um, not just with the Visual Age for this event, but also with the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, um, which has been a really meaningful way to move through this work, uh, because we're especially interested in the uh, histories of people who are uh, trans and or people of color who are low income, disabled, who are navigating, um, uh, like Alex said, um, dehumanizing systems every day, who are incarcerated. Uh, those are histories that are really vital to all of us. Um, Part of our work is to make sure that those histories are centered. Um, so for today, what we're going to do is we're each of our amazing panelists are going to have like 10 minutes to talk about whatever they want to share, which is all of it is brilliant. And um, we're going to start with Kate, and I'm going to read Kate's bio, and then after each, um, before each person, I'm going to read the bio just so we are all familiar with the really incredible work um, and lives of the people up here. So, Kate Bornstein is a world-renowned transgender activist, author, playwright, performance artist, blogger, and educator, so many things, who focuses on issues of gender and sexuality. Her books, Gender Outlaw, On Men, Women, and the Rest of Us, and My Gender Workbook are essential readings in gender queer, queer, and feminist studies. Kate's books are taught in five languages around the world, in over 200 colleges and universities, um, she lives in New York City with her girlfriend, three cats, two dogs, and a turtle, one turtle, uh, in, which, in whose company she wrote her new memoir, A Queer and Pleasant Danger, the true story of a nice Jewish boy who joins the Church of Scientology and leaves 12 years later to become the lovely lady she is today. So I'm going to hand it off to the person. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody from the Visual Aids and from the Trans Oral History. Aging. Aging or dying? That's the interesting question. <laughs> I, um, I spent two years in chemotherapy and radiation. I'm now a year and two months completely cancer-free. But, but what happens is that the chemo and radiation take a far greater, longer range toll on some aspects of life. And honestly, I don't know anymore whether it's because I'm old or it's because I've got a chemo brain that my memory is fucked up, um, my access to language is not the same as it used to be. I, I, I could, I pause like that now a lot uh, while I'm trying to get words out of my mouth. I, that never used to be the case. Um, so I'm at an interesting point now. This. Most of my life, I've been obsessed with death. Um, I, for six, I, I know of six times when I was ready to kill myself. And it wasn't really until I got through, got the diagnosis of lung cancer on top of my leukemia, they're both gone, uh, that I decided, okay, fuck it. I, I will live. I, I, I want to live. That's okay. And I was able to stop thinking about 
hurry up death and thinking about now what dying means. You know, this this shutting down, this this slowing down that, that we do. Um, I've learned the value of patience. I've learned the value of radical acceptance because there's things I can't do anymore. I can't I can't grip things because of my arthritis. Um, stairs are a challenge. And I'm alive. Aging in trans in the trans world I think is a little bit different. I'm the baby on this panel. Uh, I'm not even talking age-wise in years of my body, but I am the baby. I didn't begin transitioning until transitioning 1984. Um, and then I was, because I had been coming out, I, I took a detour um, when I was 20 years old, and I joined the Church of Scientology. It's a lot more embarrassing than saying I'm <laughs> I stayed in there you know, for 12 years, and I think part of the reason I did is because they are so virulently homophobic and transphobic. Um, but I, there, there's a whole new phenomenon coming on now where we see people who have been living their lives as heterosexual white men now all of a sudden becoming transgender lesbian women on the internet, pretty much only on the internet. And I, that, that was a lot of my route, only we didn't have the internet. Uh, I dove right into the lesbian community, then into the drag community, then into Dyke, then into Dyke SM, and I don't think of myself as aging. I do think of myself as dying, and I embrace it. I, 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 I embrace a gender change now again. Uh, I have a new gender. I am now little old lady. <laughs> that is my gender. I am having a ball with it. Uh, oh, you know how, how old people shrink? They get smaller? I was almost six feet tall. I'm now five, eight and a half. I am a little old lady, finally. <laughs> I've chosen to make my presentation in the world one of delight. Um, I want to walk around, I want to delight people wherever I go. I, I, it's the only way I can justify my vanity. <laughs> and and, and so, so that's, that's what I do. I, I've made notes because I do have memory problems. <laughs> Uh, this whole notion of coming out at, at whatever age we come out, we reset our clock. Um, I'm now 29 year old young woman. And I'm a 67 year old man. And I'm a little old lady. I don't consider myself a woman. I only did for like six months in my life. And because language has changed so much over the last five years, transgender doesn't include me anymore. This is a hoot. This is a major hoot. Back in the 80s, a bunch of us started using the word transgender. We stole it from Virginia Prince, uh, who was the first person who coined the word and ever used it. Um, we used it as an umbrella term. Uh, Jameson Green, um, Les Feinberg, uh, Lou Sullivan, a bunch of us, we started using transgender because we were transsexual. But that limited it pretty much to people using hormones 
and surgery. And we didn't want to limit it that way. And it was also limiting it to people who consider themselves men or women. And I didn't consider myself either. But I was certainly trans of some sort. And we went to transgender. Now, the big transgender tipping point really only applies to people who are some sort of man or some sort of woman. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that many other people get excluded. Gender queer, drag queens, chicks with dicks, uh, trannies. I'm, I've been calling myself a tranny ever since I learned the word from my drag mom, Doris Fish, in San Francisco uh, in, in the 80s. It was originally a word that came from the drag scene in Sydney, Australia, to unite transsexuals, transvestites, drag queens, and cross-dressers. They said family. That's what tranny was. It came to the States, it came to San Francisco as a word that said family. And a bunch of us started using it as family words. And, you know, we were all trannies, FM. Uh, the tranny sex workers, the tranny porn folks. Uh, we recognized family. We all thought we were better than everybody else. My version of transgender, of course, was better than theirs. But we recommend, we, 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 we recognized theirs were better than mine. But we recognized family. I think what happened is that as it got into becoming a commodity in tranny porn, and tranny sex work, that people who availed themselves of those felt horrible about it and turned it into a slur, turned it into a curse word. So now I find myself, my identity that I've used for 20 years upsets people. Just the pronunciation of the word upsets people. Triggers a very few people. As a hate word, yes, I've had people chase me, yell trend. Yes, I, that's a terrible, terrible thing. But it wasn't... I remember when I was in, in Philadelphia and I was walking along with my roommate at the time, this is in the 80s, lesbian woman, and I had just started... <laughs> being, sorry, cut the puppy. Um... I had just started living full time as a woman, and these college kids drove by, guys, and he leaned out the window, you lesbians! And looked at each other, like, college students! <laughs> you know, so what? And so, you know, <laughs> big deal. Um, and then, so when people call me tranny with hatred, it's, I have to stop and hear the hate in the language because, yeah, I'm a tranny, uh, yeah. Uh, it's my wish that our people in our community understand the difference between words and the emotions that, that trigger them. I've got... I've spoken my 10 minutes, and I said I would like a minute wind down, so I'm going to wind down, let's see. I told you I'm a little old lady, I told you I don't remember things, I've spoken about language, okay. Coming out of chemo and radiation, my pal, David Harrison, who was my lover when he was Catherine, and we're still dear friends to this day. He lives in the city, he's a performer. Told me that now that I have managed to stay alive and I'm old, it's time to focus on fun. And so I'm working on learning about fun, learning about guilt-free pleasure. And my advice to everybody who's not quite as old as me is to work on that now so you're not surprised when you're old. Thank you very much.
So our next speaker, thank you, is Jay Tool. Um, Inside the Miss Major J. Cool Building for Social Justice, I feel like it's a special pleasure that J. Cool and Miss Major are both here. Um, J. Cool is a 67 year old butch identified, well, super butch identified lesbian who battled addiction for over 30 years, during which time she was homeless for over 25 years and lived on and under the streets of New York City and in New York City shelters. In 1999, she got her GED and she began volunteering with the Coalition for the Homeless. In November of 2000, she left the shelter system for her first time ever apartment in her own name. In 2006, she received the Ritual Shegal National Legion of Honor Award for Emerging Activists. In 2011, Jay was honored for her service to the transgender community by the Silver Bear Law Project. In 2014, Jay was honored by Canva, one of the New York City's largest homeless providers for her work to make shelters safe for queer adults and homeless people. So, um, without further ado, what a pleasure it is to have you here. Hi. Hey, hi. So, first let me say that uh, thank you with visual arts, thank you, Raina, Jay, uh, our building, everybody, all the organizations that are in, in this building, and if you don't know about them, please look them up. There's an amazing group of organizations in here. Uh, and it feels surreal that this is where, this is the office space of Queers for Economic Justice. Yeah. If you, anybody heard of them? Yeah. You know, I was their shelter uh, program director from beginning to end and a co-founder. But I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Chloe. You know, I met Chloe, God, maybe 11 years ago, uh, and although, you know, we didn't go out and drink together, you know, we didn't socialize together, you know, we met in mental health uh, meetings, we met in all kinds of health issues, you know, we met in these meetings and always had conversations, and afterwards we would always have these conversations around homeless queers, you know, and about homeless queer adults. And Chloe, with her compassion and love, always wanted to go into these shelters and help, you know. And we, every once in a while we'd talk on the phone and see if she could go in and everything. Uh, unfortunately, you know, she was sick. And uh, she, you know, she's missed in this community. You know, she is a legend, you know, and I'm so glad to be here, you know, doing this uh, in her name. So, that's about Chloe. Uh, Miss Major. I know Miss Major, we, we met in 1963. How many of you guys, raise your hand, how many of you guys were born in 1963? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. We got you, we got you, okay. We know each other a long, long fucking time, you know. So, aging. It's fucking hard. Let me tell you, first of all, it's, you know, it's hard to age sometimes, you know. Uh, your, your body hurts, you know, arthritis, your knees, your wrists, fingers, <laughs> you know. Uh, going upstairs is a hassle for me. I try to bust it everywhere now, you know. Luckily, I have a wonderful wife <laughs> that holds me up sometimes. No. <laughs> I can stand on my own. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so when I was a kid, you know, I came out when I was 13, I was thrown out of my house and ended up living on the streets uh, of the West Village and living in Washington Square Park for so many fucking years and on the piers for so many fucking years. I have no idea how long uh, I was down there until I became homeless up in this neighborhood even. Uh, and I never thought about getting old because I thought I would die when I was 16. You know, I thought I'd be dead by 18, 21, 35. Now I'm fucking 67, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm a month younger than Kate. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I remember this thing, you know, when I was 18, I remember looking in a mirror, you know, and seeing this handsome, which I can say that about myself. You could say it also. <laughs> and, and then again,
then at age 50, I'm living in the New York City shelter system and looked in the mirror of their place, which wasn't a real mirror because glass was forbidden, uh, and looked in there and was like, who the fuck is that? You know, it was like this person had a little gray hair, had some wrinkles, and it was like still handsome. But it was like, you know, where did all those years go? You know, and, and uh, I never thought I'd reach this age. It, uh, and it was, Ian Major were talking almost all day today about years gone by and how hard it was, you know, uh, growing up in the village, you know, being homeless and street economy uh, and the drugs and the bars and, you know, we didn't think of, uh, of ourselves getting old. You know, we didn't have jobs because we couldn't get jobs, you know. We couldn't save money, you know. Uh, it was just, I had a job once underneath the name of, I think it was Aaron Siegel or something like that. <laughs> and, I, and I worked for uh, uh, Manpower, uh, me and this other young butch, and we worked for Manpower. So nothing was ever under my name, you know, if I uh, wanted to go to work in, the, in who I was, you know, just like this, you know, this is who I am. So. I could not get a job unless I used somebody else's name, somebody else's identification. So most of my stuff was dealing drugs, pimping, robbing you, you know. Uh, and and now I'm old, you know. And it's uh, it's hard looking back, you know. It's like what happened, <laughs> you know. It's you know I, I stay in my house. I have seven babies, furry babies, you know. I have a wife. And, uh, and I have family, which is you guys, whether you know it or not, you're my fucking family, yeah. you know? Uh, and, I, you know, I wonder how I'm gonna survive, you know? As elders, you know, in a community where we couldn't get jobs, where we couldn't, you know, Social Security, when we're going for Social Security, you know, we don't get that much because we weren't holding jobs, you know? have money taken out of and how do we survive in an economy that's cost so much to even buy a bagel or something, you know, or to travel. Uh, I too uh, uh, worry about traveling, you know, uh, if I can't take the bus and I have to take the trains, you know, I'm always thinking about what train station is, where the elevators are, you know, uh, how am I going to get around, you know. It's, uh, it can be hard sometimes, but not, you know, I'm not giving up. I plan to live to at least about 150, around there, you know, and still be fucking cursing, you know, still be out here telling the community that I'm here, you know, and, uh, and, and that you guys are gonna be the sage also, you know, uh, you will. You might not think so, you know, like you're going to live and have a ball and do everything you want to do right now and then. Trust me, you're going to be 67, you're going to be 73, you're going to be 80. You know, save your fucking money. <laughs> That's what I got to tell you. You know, save your money, uh, start a retirement fund. Uh, me and Major were talking earlier today, like, you know, we're thankful when people come and ask us to talk, you know, because it puts a little money in our fucking pocket. And plus, it gets our stories out there. You know, uh, it's hard to get jobs at these ages. <laughs> you know, trust me. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this is, this is our job now, coming out and talking. And if we can get a few dollars for that, we're going to take it. You know, because it can be, get us on a train or a bus or buy us something to eat. You know, uh, there is. You know, I worry about. If I'm going to need a cane or a wheelchair, you know, who's, who's, you know, the community knows who I am. They know who Major is, they know who Kate is, they know who Sheila is, and we're elders in the community. What about the fucking elders that no one knows their names, right. that are in these places or in their homes that can't get out? Who the fuck is, you know, as a community, are we looking out for them, you know? Uh, and I think we should be, you know. I think uh, all of us are gonna be in the same boat or are in the same boat right now. You know, we all need, whether it's a helping hand, 
you know, or a slap on the back, or a big smooshy kiss, you know. <laughs> we all need something from each other, you know. Uh, my biggest thing is when I, when I was homeless, I never let anybody touch me, ever. You couldn't fucking touch me. Now when I need you, and I know a lot of you know it, I have to hug you, you know, and that's not for you, that's for me. You know, as an elder and as a person that didn't want to be touched at all, now I have to have that human touch. And elders, all of us elders need that. You know, we need to have a human touch. We need someone to say it's going to be okay. We need somebody to call us up, as me and Major were talking earlier. Call us up. Do you need something from the store? Do you need to walk your dog? Do you need to go to the bank? You know? But you know, if you if you know elders or you know us, <laughs> give us a call. You know, see if we need anything. Sometimes we can't get out of the house. Sometimes we, you know, it's 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 hard sometimes. You know, and there's people older than us that are out there, and we don't know their names, and they're stuck in places, and a community is not helping them. You know, that I know of. Uh, anyway, maybe we should start something like. Uh, you know, boys, uh, what do you, a mentor, a mentor, a boy, a mentor, a girl, what is that? Something like that. What is it? Big sister, big brother. Maybe we need that. We need somebody for big elders. You know, adopt an elder. <laughs> you know, that sounds good. Adopt an elder. Help us take care of ourselves. We don't want you, you know, we just need somebody that we know that cares for us. You know, that we're not alone out here, and we're not going to die by ourselves like so many of us will, uh, and so many of us have. Uh, we just adopt an elder. I like that. I'm going to start something. <laughs> All right. Do I have 10 minutes, or am I 10 minutes? <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, thank you so much, guys. I so love to see all of your young faces in here, you know, and I can't wait till you get my age. Yeah. <laughs> So our next amazing speaker, following Jay, thank you Jay, is Sheila Cunningham. Woo! Woo! <laughs> so, um, Ms. Sheila asked the bio to not be shared online, so, um, so I'm going to read her bio. Um, so Ms. Sheila was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1954 and migrated to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the age of 13. She was. Um, Oh, okay. She was astonished by transgender girls um, that were prostituting on Broad Street, and she knew that she had a connection to that. Due to her religious beliefs, she could not transition out until the age of 15, and she was, um, that's when she ran away, dropped out, and she started taking hormones and working as a street worker. She was harassed, arrested, taken in uh, for vagrancy, sodomy, loitering, and not carrying a draft card for, at the time. She left Philadelphia in 1974 due to harassment from the Philadelphia Police Department and moved to New York City. She worked for Old Lady Cassini in a factory making belts and pocketbooks. When the factory closed in 1980, she went um, to work at the uh, automotives, General, General Automotive, General Automotives, um, making cyclops for cars. In 1986, in 1982, 82, sorry, she met L.C., who was upstate in New York, Lafayette. in Lafayette, Cunningham, okay, uh, prison, but she had known him for years from the streets, and they hooked up as partners. She started using drugs in 1987. She stopped using, took her GED, and went to John Jay College of Criminals and Justices. In 1993, she graduated with an associate's degree in correctional administration. She started working for the Office of Mental and uh, Health and Disabilities, working with children, um, and taught school for mentally challenged people from 97 to 2003 in the Bronx. She also worked for the Catholic Guardian Society for Mental Health Specialists for four children that had mental disabilities. Now she gets involved in helping other trans women not to go through the same things that she did by helping them to meet their basic needs of mental health, physical health, and social health. So, here you go, Ms. I would like to give honor to God, who's the head of my life.
because I went through hell coming up as a transgender woman. In 1971, I was going to Greater Zion, Church of God in Christ, and I used to sneak out to church, go on Broad Street and see the girls standing there selling their bodies. I was fascinated, not with them selling their bodies, but seeing men look like women. What is that? Today we call it transgender. At that time they were called drag queens on Broad and Columbia Avenue. And I was so excited about that. I couldn't do that because of my religious faith. My godfather was a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. And that was taboo or you was going to hell. And so I used to, I'm a musician. I played the organ and piano for the church. And Bishop Oakley told me that I could not live in his house that way. I was in the ninth grade going to Benjamin Franklin High School and I was terminated because of my you know, rejection of following orders of the school. You can't wear a dress to school. Boys don't wear dresses. At that time, we wore dresses. Now everybody wears pants. So that was the stigma back then of a male wearing a dress going to school. Philadelphia Police Department was a horror towards transsexuals. Mm -hmm. If they knew you was transgender, they would harass you. Had men sign complaints against you as sodomy. During the Vietnam War, you had to carry the draft card. When they checked your pockets and you didn't have no money, you was taken in 11th and Winter for vagrancy. Meaning you had no money, was not a known person in the Commonwealth of the State of Pennsylvania. Through all that harassment and abuse that I went through with the Philadelphia Police Department, I came to New York City in 1974 and said I was not going to live like that. I started taking hormones at the age of 17, and they were only $3. We didn't need nobody's approval to take no hormones. You just paid the $3 and Dr. Collin would give you a shot. And his office was on Broad and Snyder Avenue near South Philadelphia High School. And that was in 1971. But I moved here in 74 because of the, of the police department. And when I came here in 1974, I met two queens, Andy Hernandez and Sylvia Rivera. I met them on 42nd Street. We used to meet every day on the corner by the Child's Pancake House. <laughs> that was a ritual that we did every day. They were older than me at that time, because I was about 19 going on 20. And Sylvia Rivera was telling us how the police in New York City used to take the van to the clubs and march them out in handcuffs and let them out in the morning. So I started hustling and making money. Hustling means standing on the corner and turning dates if you didn't know. Yes, I was a street worker. Because that's the only way we knew how to live and survive, not having ID. We didn't have ID at that time, baby. Because we didn't want nobody to know who we really were. So we didn't have ID, so ID start coming into effect until 1976. During the bicentennial of the 200th birthday of the United States, we started getting an ID. Then we were going to doctors, getting um, silicone shots from Dr. Should I mention names? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Schiffman, Dr. Reef. I got my first no job in 1978. My insurance paid it from my job where I used to work for a lady who could see me. And that was something that I was proud of. Then in 1980, I was going to have a sex change. But I changed my mind because I was too early. And Dr. David Wester was going to perform the operation because Blue Shield and Blue Cross at that time was paying for transgender surgery. That was the only insurance that was paying for surgery at that time. Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I backed out of it because I was still not sure if I wanted to be a woman at that time. And I said, well, I'll wait until I get a little older to transition. 
Then in 1987, I got castrated, which is osteotomy for females is history. And um, I got castrated in 1987, and um, that took me through a loop. Sometimes we do things and don't realize the backlash and the stigma or the mental trauma that we go through with it. I would never do that again because it played out my mental state and I was not ready for it. So I did get surgery in 1988 at Montefiore Hospital by Dr. Arnold Melman. So my transitioning from the other um, people that got saved is very different. See, we all are transgender, but we come from different pasts and different stories. We're not all the same. And that's why I'm glad I'm up here, because I'm learning that each story has a, 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 a sentimental meaning to the person that lived it. I can't live your story. I can't live yours. I only can tell you what I went through as a transgender woman in the 21st century. We were scared. Those that looked like women did not want to be identified as transgender because the police would not know who you really were. That's why we kept it a secret. I'm just coming out as a transgender person because I didn't want nobody to know who I really was because of the backlash and the harassment that the cops used to do, the people that wore women clothing. Just now, y'all are being accepted. But when I came up, it was not accepted. A lot of the girls had to come to my house when they got out of Rackers Island because we couldn't go home to our parents came from another generation. They came from the Depression of 1933, 29 with Hoover and Roosevelt. The mothers of today are from the Vietnam War era and their kids are learning how to live as transgenders. In a black family, transgender is the worst, out of the worst of the homosexuality community. Not saying nothing biased about, my, about the minorities. I wish I was white. Because our families did not allow us to come home and bring men in our houses and say we had lovers or any of that. Some of our girls can't do it today. So my experience is quite different from a lot of y'all that live up, that's out there listening. My transgender experience was hard. As far as family-wise, I could never go home on holidays because I refused to take off the dress. I had to be other. So it's not a good story in all these stories. And the girls used to come to my house and I would make Thanksgiving dinner and holiday dinner and we would, we would sit together and cry sometimes because we couldn't go home. A lot of them got locked up for things they didn't even do. For laudering, trespassing, couldn't pay bail, didn't have money in their pockets, couldn't survive, couldn't get rooms because they were transgender. All of us did not pass. That's right. All of us didn't look real. All of us didn't have education. I didn't get a high school diploma until I was 33 years old. It wasn't because I didn't, couldn't learn. It's because the system told me I was going to be nothing. I cried in many days by myself. Without friends, without family. Sat in my house. I'm still in the apartment that I came in New York with. I'm still there. Living in Hell's Kitchen. Now if you live in Hell's Kitchen, the rent is 2500 If I lose that apartment, I will never be able to go back. That's the show to change. Growing old, I never thought I was going to live this, be this age because of my lifestyle and the things I've done. 
I'm not HIV positive, thank the Almighty God. A lot of my friends died of HIV. Not here to talk. I'm not worthy to be sitting up here talking. I didn't do nothing. That's so great for y'all to sit here and tear me out. It was the grace of God. And there's a lot of people here today. That's my higher power. Your higher power may be Buddha. Whatever higher power you have, thank God for. Because this journey was not easy, baby. And to live to see gay marriage across 50 states, some of my friends ain't never seen it. But God allowed me to see this day. Where you can go to transgender lawyers at Civil Rivera and they could change your name. Right, Dana? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ain't that amazing? Mm -hmm. How we got victory two weeks ago marching down Fifth Avenue. Marching on Transgender Justice Day by the pair. Y'all could be free. Now they're trying to take Medicaid from us, but we ain't gonna allow that. <laughs> they don't want to pay for surgery, only hormones. See, the government is trying to, see, we're last in the totem pole, but we're going to be first in sight. Hold on, because help is on the way. To the younger girls, we can go to school now. We don't have to be on back page and doing all these things we used to do. We can go to school, we can go to college, we got lawyers that can help you today to reach your goals. We don't have to walk the streets, go hold our head up high. I got 10 minutes. The sign is being shown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sign off. They want to talk to me later, baby. You can. <laughs> I'm going to get the mic back to me. <laughs> such an honor to have Ms. Major in this building um, that is named after the amazing life and legacy of both um, Ms. Major and Jay Poole. Um, and always an amazing moment to be on a, in an event with you, just like, or to be in the room with you, or watch you on YouTube, <laughs> as I do very frequently. Um, and so now I'm going to read Ms. Major's bio, which is, Ms. Major Griffin Gracie was, uh, for over 40 years, an activist and continues to be an instigator, an activist, and a community organizer. From the 1969 Stonewall Rebellion to her current work with the Transgender Variant Intersex Justice Project, Ms. Major has worked tirelessly for social justice and human rights of transgender women of color. She identifies as a father, a mother, a grandmother, a grandfather to her own children and to the many in the transgender community. Ms. Major has spoken about concerns of trans women of color in the prison industrial complex. Her life is currently the focus of a feature-length documentary film, which will be released in 2015. Thank you. Okay, this is ridiculous. So many things that I choose not to think about. 20 bucks can get you in. So, those days are gone. I got it, don't worry. <laughs> you know, I'm so glad to be here and thank you so much everybody who was involved in getting me here because it's so important because New York is home to me. And one of the things um, you think about um, as an older person, just for you all to know, is right now in your youth, you never think about it. Tomorrow is a promise to anybody. You're going to wake up one morning and you're going to be somebody you do not recognize in any way, shape, or form. You know, um, for me personally, I still feel like I'm 35. I just can't move like I'm 35. <laughs> you know, it takes me some time. And, you know, you still have to understand that we're still people as older folks. And we still have the needs that we have when we were you all age. We still need company. We need companionship, you know. No, I can't throw on some new hair and makeup, run to the bar and pull a cute boy to me anymore because I'm an older person. 
and that's fine. I'll go to rentaboy.com. <laughs> <laughs> still getting laid. There's socialization going on that we have one another to rely on. Because as you're getting older, you become more and more caught up in a situation that separates you from the rest of the world. You know, that the young people don't want to be bothered with us and older people. It takes me so long to cross the street, you know. Well, I'm upset about that too, but guess what? Go the fuck now and wait. <laughs> We don't have time for that stuff. Anymore. You know, we really have to work on making sure that we understand that we're all in this together. And where I'm at, you all are going to get to. Right. And that's God willing and the things fall together right for you so that you get there. You know, one of the sad things about being an older person is all of our friends are usually gone. That's right. All that we have is the memories of them and hopefully somebody around that we can talk to. Like having Jay around to talk to about things that no one would understand from back in 1963. But he was there. You know, so I don't have to worry about explaining that. You know, and one of the things that we get caught up in is trying to explain who we are, how we got here, what our path is. And I'm sorry, everybody's path is different. That's right. The issue is the destination are all the same. That's right. You know, you want peace of mind. You want sanity. You want to be appreciated for your abilities, not for what somebody thinks you can do by the way you're presenting or you look. It has nothing to do with what you look like. Mm -hmm. It has to do with what's in your brain, what your skills are, what you can and cannot handle, and to respect people for the choices that they make in regards to who they are. Being transgender does not mean, oh, I'm going to run and get tips or I'm going to get my tips cut off. It means that that's how I see me. And whether I do or don't have whatever, I'm to be accepted and respected for that choice that I made by taking that on. That's now, you don't want to give me that respect? That's on you. There's another bus coming. Check it and go where the hell you need. <laughs> We really have to work together on that and to appreciate people for who they are right. and how they got there. You know, everybody has a story to tell. That's right. Everybody's on a journey. And if you listen to someone else's journey, you are so much more enriched in your life and your journey that you can share your journey with them. Because as human beings, that's all that we got. No matter what you believe in, whether it's the Bible or science. That's to whatever started it, to people, to Amoeba. Well, that's good. They must have did a lot of fucking, because there's billions of them. <laughs> and we're related to one another. You know, when AIDS hit, it was the first time my girls got a chance to work and hold a legitimate job. You know, we couldn't get work. No one wanted to hire us. Well, I'm not having that work here. What I got news for you, bitch? I'm not a that. <laughs> And if you're going to call me that, make that a capital letter D. <laughs> well, this shit don't matter, you know. And in sorting that kind of stuff out, like when they took over the thing that happened at Stonewall, they have whitewashed that to death. That's right. I'm so sick of that. That's right. Because I'm sorry, last time I checked, Sylvia wasn't white, Marcia wasn't white, and last time I saw my mother, I wasn't either. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's really cute. So if you're going to have this alphabet soup shit for me, let's start off with T first. Let that be a capital letter T, small G, small L, small A. <laughs> and if you just need another capital, then a capital A. <laughs> you know, I'm questioning. Still, at 73 years old, I want to know. <laughs> if I could, I'd have a description to the inquirer. Tell me what's going on, because I've been missing shit. It's some fly, fly, fly. <laughs> But we have, you know, and, and going through that, it becomes really, really difficult for us. Like for me, I was involved in a fire a year ago, lost everything, and thank goodness for the community that's out there in California that helped support me. I'm somewhat back on my feet and acquiring the things that I need to acquire to survive. Because one of the things I know all of us go through is worry that 
now that we're this age, I'm going to be pushing a Safeway car with me and my dog and all my personal possessions are in the car. And it's a legitimate fear because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I didn't expect to get here. You know, and now that I'm here, I have no idea what tomorrow brings. You know, like she was saying, you know, death, I don't even have time to worry about death. I'm so busy trying to get my blue job and have my sex with I don't have time to worry about that. <laughs> I'm still breathing and taking this shit forward. You know? It's really easy. There may be snow on the roof, but the fireplace is burning and the bed is black. <laughs> In that regard, you gotta keep moving forward. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm back. No one's throwing dirt on my grave yet. Yes. So we need to do the thing that we have to do to stay alive. To feel vibrant. To feel as if you're a part of something and that you're contributing to it. I don't care who the transgender person is. I want them to know that somebody loves them and respects them for their choices, having never met them or ever seen them, but know that it's out there for you because I got there because of the friends that I had to get me here. So I'm here to make sure that you all get to where you need to get to. And know that somebody, no matter whether you know them or not, believes in you and that you can go forward. And yet right now things are really wonderful. You can go to school. You can acquire some things that we couldn't acquire when I was just right, you know. I got kicked out of college when I tried to go back to 61. Well, that's cute. You know, so like, oh, girl, you should tell them that you happen and you can get an honorary degree. What's an honorary degree? Should you give me that shit when I was there trying to get it? Because now it don't mean a goddamn thing to me. What I'm going to do? Or I'm 73, you put a flag on the wall. Oh, she's a doctor or whatever have you. Fuck her. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how this shit rolls. You know? You can do these things if you choose to. Now, if you still want to hug and lay on your back, flat back, yay for you. You know, if I could and if I have to, I will turn one. There's some damn money and cash only, no tax. <laughs> Don't want to take any fucking chances, you know. And uh, I, you have to believe in people and believe in yourself, you know. Because only when you do that can you progress and go forward. And for me, to all of you, please go forward. You know, sometimes you have to step back to go forward. Take the time to do it. You don't lose anything.